Yes, it is, with a few very minor variations. These are some of the most popular personal computers. You started off with a pet. Then you tried an apple. This one is the Radio Shack. This the Atari. Behind you is the IBM personal computer. And over there is the Texas Instruments computer. And the Xerox computer. They all accept programs on either cassette or disc. And they all look like typewriters plugged into a TV set. Yes, they all have a keyboard and a screen. Sometimes the keyboard has a built-in TV set, but usually you plug it into a separate TV. And computers are getting smaller all the time. This isn't a calculator, it's a computer. The Radio Shack Pocket Computer with a tiny built-in screen. And this one here is the Sinclair. It's the smallest and cheapest computer so far that can be plugged into a full-size TV screen. It comes with a 1K of memory that can be expanded to 16K. These are real computers, and just like the bigger ones, they're all based on the binary code. You know, when I think about it, bits and bytes and the binary code and K and all of that stuff, it really wasn't all that hard. But come on, own up. When does the heavy math start? If you want math, you can get math. But computers don't necessarily have to be involved with mathematics. You can use them for anything you like. I don't know. There's something pretty involved going on in there. It's almost as if it had a mind of its own, you know? What's really going on? This is where we come down to the essence of the computer. If we could distill this mysterious substance, what would we see? We'd probably see ancient Greece and Aristotle, who was the first person to write down what he called the laws of thought, or what we call logic. Now, the essence of logic is that it divides everything in life into two categories. Is it this or that? Heads or tails? Good or bad? Black or white? It must be one or the other. There are no shades of gray in logic. True or false? Yes or no? On or off? Which is where the computer comes in because its circuits must also be either on or off. The other important thing about logic is the logical argument itself, which goes something like this. All tall men are thin. Jim is a tall man, therefore Jim is thin. If the first two statements are true, we can be absolutely certain that the third statement is true. On the other hand, if there are some tall men who are not thin, then we can't be sure that the third statement is true. And in black and white logic, if we can't be sure that it's true, then it must be false. Which is where the computer comes in again. Because this is precisely the sort of argument that an electrical circuit likes to deal with. If we imagine one of these circuits as being like this, with a power source, a battery, two switches and a light bulb, then we can see that the electric current from the battery can only reach the light bulb and make it light up when both switches are on. If either switch goes off, the light goes out. Now, as far as the circuit is concerned, on or off can just as easily stand for true or false. So if the first switch is statement one in our logical argument, and the second switch is statement two, and the light bulb is statement three, then only when both of the first two statements are true can the third statement also be true. But if either of the first two statements is false, then the third statement must also be false. What all this boils down to is that a computer is not a calculating machine. It's a logic machine. It doesn't so much compute things as argue about things in a strictly logical black and white fashion. So what you're saying is that these computers are nothing but a bunch of little electric Aristotles turning each other on and off? That's a good way of putting it. And what I've been feeding them by means of a disc or cassette is really a series of logical arguments? Exactly. Those two educational games you looked at were both based on logical arguments. Okay, I played a couple of games based on logic. Now, what else can the computer do for me? That's what this whole series is about. Here's a preview of what's coming up. 
we'll be looking at how to write simple programs. Then, print, quotation, late, exclamation point, quotation. Don't forget the colon. Don't forget the colon. There we are. And go to 20. That is terrific. Oh. Yeah, but my program isn't finished yet, is it? Not quite. How to file information on the computer. So this program is now permanently on the disk. Type catalog and you'll see. Okay. Ah, oh, hey, that's terrific. You know, I can save all sorts of things on a disk. How to get computers to communicate with each other. Now your computer will be able to hear messages and speak into the telephone itself. And this is all coming from Willowdale, Ontario? How computer languages work. In the early days of computing, there was a language barrier between computers and humans because you had to use machine language if you wanted to talk to the computer either in binary code or its exact English equivalent. This was very slow and laborious. We'll also investigate computer graphics. Computer music. Word processing. If I'm doing one thing such as text editing, and I realize, oh, I really can't finish this document because I forgot some information. I simply want to move to a different window on the screen, search for what I want, copy it, and paste it into the original document that I was working on. And video disks. And video text systems. In the program that comes immediately after this one, We'll look at some everyday applications of the computer. How it can help you work out your finances. Why? Enter. Oh. Now press the space bar for each succeeding year. <laughs> I definitely have to ask for that raise. And even help you learn French. Oui, Anne. Oui, Anne. This is fun. Can the computer understand me? We'll also have segments on the speed of the computer. If the computer could see us, to its eyes, we would appear to be moving about as fast as a lump of rock. And two different types of memory, ROM and RAM. The computer can read this left half of its memory, but it can't write on it. It can't change it. It is therefore called read-only memory, or ROM. But the computer can, in a sense, write on the other half of its memory. This half is called random access memory, or RAM. Until then, I'm Luba Goy for Bits and Bytes. And I'm Billy Van. Bye for now.